Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today is a luxury home builder, author, and ultra marathoner. He started off with a $50,000 fixed wrapper and climbed all the way up to a $50 million oceanfront mansion. He's been featured on Oprah 2020 HGTV just to name but a few. Frank McKinney joins us today. Frank, welcome to Purchase the Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Well, we got to purchase first before we make our money, right? We make our money the day we buy, and I'm excited. I've heard a lot about your podcast. I made a special trip back to my treehouse where I create all my oceanfront homes from. I work from a treehouse just to partake in your podcast today, Seth, so I'm excited. I I really appreciate it. And and that's why the show's named Purchase to Profits, because you can't profit until you actually make a purchase. You got to exercise that risk threshold like a muscle. You got to take the risk, you know, in, in this business, actually in life. I, I, when I started in, in real estate, I, I came out of a high school with a, with a 1.8 grade point average. I had no hope of pursuing a formal education. I had a $50 bill and a one-way plane ticket from Indiana to South Florida. I had no connections. I had no network. I had no money. I had no education. But what I had, as I look back almost on a post-mortem of my career, I'm doing my last project now after 30 years. I had the ability to embrace risk and, and really to, to, to make that purchase, right? I mean, I was a tennis instructor after I was a maintenance worker. I was making a six-figure income as a tennis instructor. I had a great, I had a Ferrari when I was 21 from teaching tennis. And, and yet there was more. And real estate, the people I taught tennis to, Seth, they, they gave me, I guess I earned my PhD in entrepreneurship and my master's in real estate teaching tennis to people who made their fortune in real estate. And that kind of gave, was that the, was that the light bulb moment when you started interacting with these people who had built wealth in real estate? I'm a corn fed country boy from Indiana, oldest of six. I, I, you know, I was, I was destined to work on a farm, I guess. But at 18, when I left Indiana, there was a show on TV, maybe a little bit before your time, um, called Lifestyles of Rich and Famous. And, and, and for younger people it would be like MTV Cribs where I got, as a voyeur, you got to look inside the lifestyle of successful people on this television set. Well, when I moved to Florida, I was a maintenance worker on a golf course, Seth. I got to see it for real. I got to see real lifestyles of rich and famous playing golf all day. Ultimately, they moved to the tennis court where I was teaching, and they're playing tennis over there. It fascinated me. I'm young. I'm impressionable. I'm consumeristic, and I'm materialistic when I'm 18 or 19. How did you get this life? And, and I, I got my certificate to teach tennis. It was almost like, you know, here, here's my, my license out of poverty, right? I went from $4 an hour to $50 an hour with this, this diploma to teach tennis. And the people I were teaching tennis to, they drive up to their tennis lesson in a Ferrari, a Lamborghini. They'd close the door behind them on a fancy mansion. They'd have a beautiful a Beyonce lookalike wife or a Richard Gere lookalike husband. Beautiful kids, a yacht. And I'm like, I have to find out how you get this lifestyle. But how? They're all the way over on the other side of the net. And I have to give them my all, you know, how to hit a better forehand and a backhand. And then the next client comes out. After about six months of this, I thought, you know what? I'm young. I'm in good shape. I'm going to get these people tired on purpose. So they had to sit down. They couldn't finish an hour-long tennis lesson, and I could pick their brain. I had no idea what the answer was going to be. But over a two-year span, how did you get to get the beautiful car and a beautiful wife and the house and the yacht? Oh, Frank, I was a very successful trial lawyer, but when I'm a lawyer, but when I won my first case, I started investing in real estate. And now I have 50,000 rental units that pay me 600 bucks a month. That was a true story. That's $30 million a month. You hear a story like that, Seth, once, it's entertaining. But what if you hear a story like that a dozen times? Real estate related, anecdotal ending to their lifestyle, the rich and famous. Didn't take me long, two years, where I earned that PhD in, in entrepreneurship, master's in real estate to where I bought my first fixer upper, a crack house in a bad part of town for 36 grand and flipped it and sold it for 50,000. Yeah, and, and you talked about the appetite for risk. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're an ultra marathoner, you've done some really neat races. Do you think the two go hand in hand with the perseverance with the physical activity and, and the risk taking and drive with real estate? It's yes. I mean, I have an addiction problem and I'm addicted to excitement. <laughs> I yeah. mean, really, my therapist says, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I might look super exciting. Like I'm a big, you know, partier. I go to bed at eight o'clock at night. I get up at like this morning I was up at three 30 to go run 20 miles. Yeah. I'm a lot less exciting than I look, but embracing 
the fear associated with risk. If I can impress upon your listeners and viewers one thing, it is when we think about taking a risk, the thought of taking a risk is what induces fear. Mm -hmm. It's not the actual taking of the risk. It's the thought of taking the risk. So give a simple example. You hop on a, uh, a, a roller coaster and you're clickety clacking and you're going up for the first time up that hill before it reaches the top. Your heart's in your throat. You're terrified. The thought of what's about to happen is what overcomes us. Once that roller coaster takes the dive, we're having a great time. It's the same thing with risk in life, and in particular in real estate. It's the thought of leaving the nine to five and coming out from behind the cubicle and getting out there and taking a risk by buying your first piece of property that induces that sensation of fear. But fear, so I'm afraid every day of my life. I have not overcome it. I just don't stop. I don't let it stop me. It's a big difference. Fear is a very natural feeling to feel. But, but Seth, risk is always associated, almost always associated with a big change or a big challenge in your life. Change could be dietary, could be relational, getting out of a bad one into a not different one, could be spiritual. Challenge could be an ultra marathon, it could be something fit running or something like that. But it's the, okay, I'm gonna take a risk and I'm gonna run that bad water ultra marathon. This is a 135 mile race across the Death Valley Desert. The thought of that is extremely intimidating, but if I can get past that fear that's associated with the thought of taking the risk and risk being associated with big change or challenge, my life has been fulfilled because of that one approach to taking risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I think there's so many people out there that always say they want to get into real estate, but then three years later, they still haven't taken the leap because there's something holding them back. And, and that's that fear of the unknown because they haven't experienced oh, that before. I'm gonna stop you there. It's not okay. the fear of the unknown. You, this, this is something, I, I can't take credit for this. Anthony DeMello, if you wanted some recommended reading today, Anthony DeMello, very few people have heard of him. He was a philosopher. Uh, he was a Jesuit, but a philosopher that died in, in 1987, I think. Reading, I've read all his books. And what he says about the fear of the unknown, and this really rings true. How can we fear something we don't know? We can't. What we fear is leaving the known. Mm. Oh, light bulb goes off. Yeah. I was a tennis instructor making 100 grand a year, holding beautiful women around the waist and having a wonderful time in South Florida. I, I feared leaving the known. I can't fear something I don't know about, which was real estate. That's the problem. People yeah. are comfortable in the cubicle. People are comfortable in the doctor's office or doing whatever they're doing to make their nine, put food on the table. And, and I'm not saying drop everything and invest in real estate. I was a tennis pro for four years before I slowly, like pulling the needle out of an arm, slowly weaned myself off the tennis court into real estate full time. So don't ever let anybody tell you it's the fear of the unknown. No, you're afraid of leaving what you know. Yeah, no, I, that, that's really interesting uh, approach to it that I never considered before. And it, it's interesting because you know, somebody sitting in their cubicle, they, they have the fear of leaving what they know, but they're also unhappy with how their life is going and, and that they're not reaching their full potential. So it's almost like you're being pulled in two different directions. My, my feeling is, and, and, and I did sit in a cubicle, only my cubicle was a tennis court. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was a great job. It was, but if I was still teaching tennis, Seth, and that, that was 30 plus years ago, I'm, I was making a hundred grand then. I might be making one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars now. Yeah. Right. So, so really, that I, I felt that, and same with. So we have, we all have the cubicle. Let's just use that as the metaphor. The cubicle to me says I can leave the cubicle and start real estate. And if it doesn't work, I can go back to the cubicle. I take huge risks. I build houses worth tens of millions of dollars. Me, the bank, the IRS, and my wife are the only partners. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 they're all built on speculation. 44 projects since 1992 with an average selling price of $14.5 million without a buyer in mind. If one day, and, I, and, and I've come close to be dumpster diving, I, I risked it all. I built a $50 million house on spec. Uh, and, and I remember there was a guy from MIT, a professor, saying there was no market for this. It was a big kind of debate in, in a, on the cover of USA Today a few years ago. And I thought, well, what if that guy's right? You know, what if I am dumpster back? Well, guess what? I can always go back to the cubicle. I can always go back to the tennis. I can pick up a tennis racket tomorrow and go make a hundred grand. Yeah. You 
watching this or listening to this can go back to your cubicle anytime, but what do you have to lose? Real estate's the greatest wealth builder, Warren Buffett's words, not mine, mm -hmm. in the history of the United States, history of the world, really. Why not take a chance and do it? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, so how did your look, your, how, how did your perception of real estate or your understanding of real estate have to change from going from that first $50,000 fixer upper to scaling up to those larger properties? What paradigm shift had to occur? Okay, so the first thing you, you have to do is you have to consider yourself a real estate artist. I am. I'm a real estate artist. I build three-dimensional art on a sun-drenched canvas known as the Atlantic Ocean. Seth, when I was doing my smaller projects, it didn't take me long. To, by the way, for those of you, 44 projects, 14 and a half million, I didn't do a house worth more than 100 grand for five years. Five, from 1986 or seven to 1992, didn't do a house worth more than hundred grand. What happened was I got really good at the craft of real estate, not the business of, the craft of real estate, to the point where if you read Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything in life. Mm -hmm. I, I read that book a few summers ago and I said, wow, and I'm pretty mathematical, I did the math. Oh, 10,000 hours is five years full time. 1987 to 1992, not a house worth more. I became an expert at the craft of real estate. So my, my suggestion is become that expert at the craft of real estate and consider it a craft. Consider it artistry. Me, what I mean by that is, is, is don't cut the corners. Don't, when you do that, you all, you, the only thing you're doing is tearing down your reputation. I might, my margins might be a little more compressed than others, but my reputation has built. My, mm -hmm. I've built my reputation over a 30-year span to be now the foremost, the preeminent real estate artist building spec houses on the ocean around the world. So that shift of, of if I walked into an art, art store, if you were an artist and you walked into an art store, would you buy the cheapest paint? Would you buy the, the cheapest paintbrush or the cheapest palette? And would you try? No. Or the cheapest clay to mold your pottery? No, you wouldn't. You'd buy the best. You'd put in the best. And you'd have the passion for it. That's how I approach my craft. And, and I, I, I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. I am starting to paint because I, I will be a painter. I can't sculpt. But taking that artist approach to real estate has rewarded me extremely well, and it can, it can you as well. Yeah. And you mentioned your, your reputation. You, know, you just put out a video. You've got the girls beside you on the beach. You've got the flamethrower going. Um, that, that's, your, that's your brand. And, and you have, uh, for, for me, just meeting you, it seems like you have a very unique brand that, you know, when you see your, your you say, that's Frank McKinney, that, that's, his, that's his thing. Um, how has your brand evolved over the years and how important has branding been to your success? It's too bad we only have a half hour because we can make a half hour show out of each one of these segments. It's critical. Risk is a whole half hour show. Brand, personal branding. Personal branding, you're writing down. Personal branding is the art of amplifying your essence to the state where your customer, current or potential, becomes subliminally intoxicated with you first, then your product. Mm. One more time. Personal branding is the art of amplifying your essence to the point where your customer, current or future, become subliminally intoxicated with you first, then your product or service. Most people put the, the product or service first. That's okay in, in a business where you don't have a ton of competition. Real estate, I mean, if you strip it all down, well, Frank's a real estate artist, he's, he's the real estate rock czar, but I'm in, the, I'm in a mundane business called building houses and selling them to people. Yeah. How many people I'm not competing with? So, so I learned over the years to amplify what set me apart. And that what you see here, we only see part of me here, but what you see here is the way I was in high school. And I realized, you know what, that's, that I am an artist and I'm going to take an artist approach to, to my craft. I encourage people to amplify and sit, it's fun because you can focus group this. You sit down with your friends and say, what sets me apart in your mind? What mm -hmm. is it that I could use to, like, I, I just coached a woman who was an opera singer and wanted to get into real estate. And we made her the operatic realtor and, and she's killing it. She goes to her, meet her, her listing appointments and she sings. I mean, just little things like that and she's killing it. She's making a ton of money. What can you do to amplify your essence? Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm, I'm really glad 
you, you framed it that way. So for yourself, as you were starting to build your brand and, and finding that essence, did you have any false starts or did you go down any wrong paths and have to bring it back again? Yeah, some people still wonder, like, why, why didn't he cut his hair? And, you know, why, why, why did you have to wear those kind of clothes? And if you don't know who I am, it actually, early in my career, Seth, it worked to my favor, to my advantage, because I would walk in where nobody knew who I was, and, and I could just see their mouths drop. I even had longer hair back then, and yeah. I changed my hair color all the time. And But all I needed was, like, that 30 seconds to a minute where they were just taken aback. I don't come with the house. You know, I, it, the show really starts when you walk in the front door and I take a back seat. You mm-hmm. come to one of my grand unveilings, you'll see what I'm talking about. They're extremely theatrical, very over the top, Las Vegas, Broadway. But in the end, there's a method to the madness. The, the, the show doesn't go with the house. I don't go with the house. It's getting that right buyer or the multi-million dollar producer broker into the property or, or you know, a VIP or media. Mm-hmm. And, and so I've had... I still to this day have a lot of, of, of false starts because I, I, I experiment. I'm constantly experimenting with our design ideas, with some of our marketing stuff. And, you know, the only way to learn is to experiment. Yeah, for, for sure. And so for, for yourself, you're experimenting, you're experimenting all the time. Do you have any routines you follow um, that, that helps that creativity or helps you on the business side? Uh, I mean, physical routine. I just, I just don't think a whole lot productive happens after like nine o'clock at night. I, I really think it's time to shut it down. And and I do get up at three thirty or you know four at the latest. And I use that time while I'm out training for my ultra marathons or, or going to the gym as a time to come up with some of the ideas that I come up with when it comes to design. Because I design all my own houses, and I'm not, you know I'm not an architect. Uh, I, I think I think you have to be comfortable being alone. Um, I work from a treehouse. I, I have a tree, an oceanfront tree house. I keep looking up because the ocean's right over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, there's so many naysayers out there, and there's so many people who, who don't get you and won't get you, and you'll end up kind of have with that herd mentality when they tell you you shouldn't be doing this. You need to be comfortable being on your own and being alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've been, you know, I've been married almost 30 years, and my wife does all the interiors of our houses, but still I don't have a ton of friends that relate to what I do. And that you've got to be okay with that. The other thing – that I suggest that you do, go to museums. I do, I visit a lot of museums and, and not that I'm looking to copy a, you know, a, piece of, a piece of art. I'll get inspired by looking at a particular painting or something on the wall that'll cause for me to grab a color out of that. Like the countertops I'm putting in my final masterpiece are made of 11,000 year old blue lava from France. And that kind of came from visiting, uh, visiting an, a, an art um, gallery. The other thing, I don't know if you, if you follow me on, on social media, I put up a video of this jellyfish sphere that I'm putting into my house. It's five feet in diameter. There's not a single one in a private residence in the United States. There is one in, in a public aquarium. Those kind of things, because even if you're building $100,000 houses or, or renovating and flipping $100,000, $200,000 houses, you want to move your customer from I need to put a roof over my head to I desire yours. Mm-hmm. Moving, it's a whole other 30 minutes, but moving somebody from need to desire, I have a bigger challenge, Seth, because these people don't need another house. They have five of them already all over the world. I have to cause for their impulse window, because that's what I operate on, impulse window to open. And while I open the impulse window with the jellyfish sphere, 11,000-year-old countertops, I have to be able to close them. Because yeah. if I can't close them, the window shuts and they say, ah, we don't need another house in Florida. Let's just stay in our Hawaii house this summer. Yeah. And so uh, you, you talked about that, that, that window of opportunity. How, how, do you, how do you make sure you're there at the right time to close them as that window is opening up? First thing you got to do is open the window. So let's talk about that. Okay. You need, we're going back to that, that subliminal euphoria thing again. You need to heighten the experience your buyers have with their five senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste during a showing, be it for sale or for rent. I'm very keen, and if if you've read my book, Burst This, I I enumerate 166 different marketing things I do to touch the five senses, and these five senses are touched within the first 30 minutes of a showing, and I have a big house. I have big houses that I'm showing, so I have more time. 
I'm, you know, so, so what I do to make sure that, that the, the, the sight aspect is, is, is subliminally intoxicated and the sound and the smells and the touches, like you walk in my master bedroom, I have carpet that's $250 a yard imported from Holland. I make you take your shoes off. It's not because I'm worried about you getting it dirty. We have more sensory receptors in the bottom of our feet than we do anywhere else in our body. I want you to feel that carpet. That's a feeling thing or go up to the walls of my theater and touch the red velvet. Mm -hmm. That's what we do to, to open the impulse window. And it can be a $200,000 house. Don't have to be a $20 million house. Sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. You got to touch them all. And you got to touch them all really quick when you, when you set up your house for showing. Now, when it's open, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's, it's a different game for a $200,000 buyer. Mm. If, 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 if you're appealing to a $200,000 buyer, you have to be confident that your house is a $225,000 house. That they're going to get more value, more quality of life from your purchase, purchasing your house, than they will from the guy down the street. That's where the real estate artist comes in, Seth. At my level, I have to, I have to, I'm really good at reading body language. I'm at all my showings, by the way, although I do list all my properties. I'm, I believe in listing with brokers. I, I would never approach it without listing with brokers. But I have to be really quick at reading body language and determining if I've got a live one. Uh, and I will have many people walk, because I sell my houses fully furnished down to the gold plated toothbrush in the bathroom, linens on the beds, towels in the closets. I'll have people walk in the door on a Tuesday set and they'll be sleeping there on Friday. That's how quick I got to open that window and how quick I got to close them. I've had people call me and say, Frank, I don't, I, I don't know what just happened. My wife's really pissed at me. I bought this house without even showing it to her. You know, I mean, that's how fast we get people to, to move. <laughs> oh, that, that's awesome. And, and speaking, speaking of all, all, the per, all the deals you've done, is there one that stands out as a keystone deal? I hope this last one will be it. So I can't give you the postmortem on it yet because we're not done. Yeah. Maybe we come back and we talk about that because this this is my final my final masterpiece. Uh, I, I guess I guess the fifty million dollar house would have to be the biggest game changer for me because I bought and sold that house twice. I could have retired on that house alone. I I bought this is a public record. I bought it from the heirs to the National Enquirer uh, when, when the husband died. The wife was living in a thirty thousand square foot house by herself, no kitchen. No master bedroom. Took me 18 months to, to rework that house. It was a, it was a it was a glorified renovation, glorified flip, I guess, right? Yeah. So so we did that. Sold it for uh, in the 30s, and the guy I sold it to didn't want it anymore after two years. Uh, he's what I call a house hobbyist, and they exist. They they live in a place. They, they they like it for a little while. They have a ton of money, and they just want to move on. And I bought it back from him for 19 million after selling it for 30. I did another re remake on it completely. It was actually like five years later by that time. And, uh, and we sold it for close to 50 million. So, I mean, really that, that taught me, um, it taught me one important real estate lesson. And that is since the Roman era, like maybe before the Roman era, before BC, there's two segments of the marketplace that are relatively recession proof. The first time home buyer, because the teacher who's married to a county sanitation worker who has decent credit and has, has reliable income, I believe, and, and don't take this as a knock on people who are kind of buy and hold and, and you know, rent things, because that's just not me. I believe the American dream was meant to be owned, not rented. And I sell the, I've sold the American dream from 50,000 all the way up to 50 million. Mm -hmm. I advocate people own the American dream. There's times to rent and there's a great way to build a fortune holding your portfolio. I'm just not the guy to talk to about that. I don't, I believe in it. It's just not me. So I realized that, that there was a reason I did really well for those first five years because I didn't do a house worth more than 50 grand or I'm sorry, hundred grand started at 50, got to hundred. I made a lot of money. Our margins back then, Seth, were $25,000 per house, more or less on a hundred thousand dollar sale. Pretty good. 25% margin. That segment will always be recession proof. So if you're getting, you're in your cubicle and you think about starting, you don't need to start at the high end level. You start right there. There's plenty of opportunity there mm -hmm. to sell the American dream. In between, I think they're susceptible to the swings in the market and the, and the, you know, the economy and the stock market. The ultra wealthy is another class since the Roman era that has been relatively recession proof. 
And, and while people say, well, there's so few people that can afford what you do for a living. I mean, really, Frank, there's so few people that can afford the house I'm building now is $17.5 million. There's probably 50,000 people in the world that can afford that. My response that that big deal taught me was, how many people are there out there, okay, we know there's 50,000, going after what I build, similar to what I build? How, what, what, what's the competition out there? Mm -hmm. I, I love my, number, my, my chances. There's, I know my competition. I know the south of France, the town Riviera, Malibu, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Hawaii, Palm Beach. I know what I'm competing against. And there's very few properties like the ones that I build going out after those 50,000 people. Yeah. And, and what makes your current project the last one you're doing? What, what, what told you it was time to move on to something else? Okay. So most people, when they come to the end of their career, again, I've been doing this, like I said, my first deal was 1987. Uh, so that's 32 years on the ocean. I've been building since 1992. Um, here's what I came to the conclusion. Most people get to the end of their career completely burnt out, meaning there, there hasn't been passion for years. I have more passion now for what I do because I'm better at it. I'm more discerning. I'm more aware than I've ever had. I thought, well, isn't that a good time to go out? Because I will, I won't have to, like a flywheel, crank up that passion and try to find something else I'm passionate about. I'll just redirect it into something else. And I don't even know what it is on purpose because I don't want to take my focus off of what I'm doing. The finishes in this house, by the way, if you're, you know, you're watching or listening, go to 3492southocean.com. 34, it's a number, 3492southocean.com. Uh, you can see what I'm doing there. I mean, and, and my grand unveiling, we just announced the date as being May 23rd. I don't know when this is going to air, but we have tickets. You can come for a donation to our charity. We built self-sufficient villages in Haiti. I've built 26 of them in, in Haiti in the last 16 years. For a $200 donation, you can come and watch the spectacle and see the grand unveiling and the theatrics and the pyrotechnics and the stunt show, but you're really coming to see the show. And, and so, so, Seth, when I'm done, uh, I'll just redirect that passion to something else, maybe painting or something. Yeah. And, and looking back, do you wish you went bigger sooner? So when you were doing those fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar, you know, um, projects, do you wish you went bigger faster? No, I don't. Okay. I really don't. I needed to become that expert in the craft of real estate and spend the five years. I loved those days. I loved my little houses. I loved those projects. They were the nicest little crack houses on the block when I got done with them. I mean, they weren't crack houses anymore, but they were crack houses when I bought them. No, I, I think the only regret was when I was a tennis instructor, I probably was ready to pull the trigger on the first property maybe a year before I had the guts to do it. I had saved the money. I had a few tennis students that had said they would loan me a few bucks to buy a fixer upper. I saved 30 some thousand dollars on my own. I had borrowed another 70 grand. So I had a hundred thousand saved. And back then, that would buy you a, a, a house, maybe two, that you could put ten grand into and, and flip. Mm -hmm. But I was scared. I was I, I was like most other people. I sat in that, that cubicle, metaphorical cubicle, a little too long, too comfortable, afraid to leave a hundred thousand dollar a year job teaching beautiful women on the ocean, driving around in a Ferrari. I, I was afraid. And 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 looking back, I mean, whatever that was so long ago. But but that's one thing that maybe if I started earlier, I, I could be retiring earlier. <laughs> Yeah, no, for, for sure. So Frank, um, you mentioned uh, your books. Uh, if somebody's looking to get a hold of your books or uh, find out about what you're doing, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, the best thing to do really, you've been to my website, right, Seth? I mean, it's really a fantastic, uh, talk about a, like a roller coaster ride. I've written six books, uh, five different genres. So I got a couple books on real estate. Really the one burst of this, Frank McKinney's Bubble Proof Real Estate Strategies is everything I've learned in my 30 years. Uh, it's it's a comprehensive book. Pay attention to the marketing chapter. That's the thickest chapter. You can overpay for an opportunity. You can overimprove it. But by smart marketing, you can make up for a, a couple of mistakes or sins, I call them. Uh, I, I got a young reader fantasy novel. If you like Harry Potter, Twilight, Narnia, Hunger Games. I've got a spiritual book called The Tap. I just released a, uh, a new book called The Other Thief, which is a Christian romance novel. That's my newest release. But if you go to Frank Dash, which is a hyphen, not an underscore, but a hyphen, frank-mckinney.com, you can take tours of some of the houses that I've built. You can read sample chapters of the book. 
books. But the, mo the most important thing, we didn't spend any time on it really, is, is please go to our Caring House Project Foundation page because there's a passage in the Bible that states, to whom much is entrusted, much is expected. I was entrusted with a lot, and I take a lot of the profits that we make from our house, sale of our big houses, and build self-sufficient villages in Haiti. As I mentioned, I built 26 of them, housing 12,000 children, desperately poor children and their families over the last 16 years. Learn a little bit about how you can dovetail your professional highest calling, what you do for a living, with your spiritual highest calling. Yeah, that's a whole other thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have you back on at, at some point and go through it in more detail. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed this conversation, so I, I just want to say thanks so much for taking time and sharing your success. All right, everybody, get out there and take that risk. Right, get out from beneath that cu beneath that cubicle, behind that cubicle, and get out and take a risk. Real estate is a fantastic way to make a living. Yeah, no, oh, that, that's so true. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well in your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.